Hi, everyone. It's great to be in Barcelona for my first Mobile World Congress as uh, Nokia CEO. And thanks to everyone at uh, GSMA for arranging this event despite the circumstances. Nokia's almost 157 years of existence has seen some real highs, moments of genuine progress for humanity and uh, also for our planet. And we have also seen some real lows, and uh, I guess we all agree that uh, now we are definitely seeing another low. I was shocked by the invasion of Ukraine and the violation of international laws and the use of violence. Collaboration is the best way to improve living standards across the world. Conflict is not. It leads to misery. It's, in a way, you know, it's, it's almost absurd to be talking to you today about anything else while there is a war ongoing in Europe. While when I was preparing for this event, I was planning, and I'm still planning, to talk about other significant problems the world is facing and the role of technology in solving them, what we all in this room can do to solve some of these really, really significant problems. Actually, we rephrased Nokia's company purpose about a year ago. It now reads that at Nokia we create technology that helps the world act together. I have a passion for this topic. And of course, the most important one that we are talking about is climate change. There was a new IPCC report published uh, actually yesterday. It went almost unnoticed for understandable reasons, but uh, it was not pleasant reading. We are not doing anywhere near enough. We are not doing anywhere near enough to deal with the situation. And instead of war games, our leaders should be sitting down together and thinking about what they really should do about this thing. I will get to the technology link between climate change and, uh, as I said, everything that, that everybody in this room can do. So bear with me a second while I set the scene. This chart that you are seeing here shows global temperature difference from or, uh, global temperature development between 1880 and then all the way to 2020. The last eight years were the hottest ever recorded, according to NASA. The global temperature is already about 1.1 degrees above pre-industrial levels. But then, yes, I mean, there is always this question that, that, that yeah, climate has changed before as well, and uh, is this actually that fast? And, and there has been ice age, ages and so on. So let's have another look. Here you see world's temperature development for the last 22,000 years since the last ice age. And yes, as you can see, there was, after the ice age, there was quite a significant increase in temperature, about three degrees globally. Then after that, there was a gradual decline, about 0 0.7 degrees. But look what has happened just in the last few tens of years. Never in our history has the change been as fast as it has been now. And now we are all, I mean, you, you have all been listening to these uh, messages about the Paris Agreement, 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees. I mean, all the evidence that we have today suggests that this is going to be looking like more like a, a 3 or 4 degree world than a 1.5 or 2 degree world. And if I just to make the point, would now show you that three degree warming by the end of the century would look like this. And this may be an optimistic scenario if we don't do drastic and quick action. This may be an optimistic scenario. And <clears throat> if it goes like this, now knowing that there's a lot of interdependencies and back different types of back channels in the, in the world, in the globe and in the atmosphere, in the system that are not even all known to us. Who would believe that it will stop there? We all know the reason for this. It's very simple. We, too, we, we pump too much CO2 into the atmosphere, about 50 billion 
tons each year, and energy production accounts about three quarters of that. The world uses about 155,000 terawatt hours of energy every year. COVID actually meant that it dropped a little bit in 2020, but now it's coming back uh, again. Here you see the development since world primary energy develop uh, consumption development since year 1800. And you also see the sources of the primary energy that we are using. Yes, there is a lot of investment in renewables, and that's of course great. And there is also nuclear, which is CO2 free. But then there are countries that are shutting it down, like Germany at the moment, Belgium. <laughs> but you can see that despite all the good talk and, and the big investments that we have made, how tiny, tiny, tiny little, little part it is. About 80% of our primary energy today comes from gas, oil, and coal, the fossil fuels. So this is, this is pretty dramatic. And, and when you look at this, you start to realize that, that uh, how massive this challenge is. There is only one real solution, and that is technology. Now I've showed you a couple of charts that make you despair. So let's now get to the maybe there is hope side of this chat. Let's see how technology can help. Here is one example, and bear with me, I'll explain, you. I'll, I'll explain to you what you, will, what you will see. The blue lines here show how the World Energy Agency forecasted each year, so this is 2006 forecast, for the further development of how much new solar capacity would be installed in the year, in, in the world, in the coming years. And as you can see, the forecast was flat, so the same amount to be installed every year, meaning that the development would be linear. And then these are the forecasts that Energy, that um, Energy Association published, uh, has published each year, and you can see the latest forecast. But then the blue, red line is what actually happened. So what we have witnessed is exponential development. And this is, of course, extremely important because what we are seeing in many technologies, including many technologies that we are all applying in this room, when a new technology really gets going, uh, you can get huge growth, exponential go growth, far surpassing even the most optimistic predict predictions. And I'm, of course, here using solar only as one example. The bigger point is that it's easy to underestimate how quickly new technologies can be adopted and roll rolled out. And of course, green technologies are improving all the time. They are becoming lighter, smaller, and cheaper, which is really, really good. Now, here we see then, and, and now I, since, I, since I talked about solar, and you don't see yet solar on this chart, I'll come to that soon. Here you see between 2009 and 2019 <clears throat> how the cost of electricity generation has developed between different uh, sources. You have gas speakers, you have a gas combined cycle, then the gray line is uh, coal. Uh, then there is uh, nuclear, which has been creeping up a little bit. Great development, the green line for uh, onshore wind. About 70% uh, drop in 10 years. But then the real champion, solar. So solar has moved from most expensive form of generation, electricity generation to the cheapest. 89% drop in 10 years, 89%, and this is expected to continue. And uh, many of you may have heard this, but, uh, but the sun is actually radiating about the same amount of energy onto the Earth every hour that the whole globe uses in a year. So that is the source, that is the source. We just need to be keep, keep developing the technology and investing. Now, the fundamental challenge with all this will be connectivity. And let me explain why. In the electricity system, there is one very simple and easy to understand rule. Consumption and generation need to be in balance every second. 
If that is not the case, the electricity system loses its frequency and then we are in big, tr big trouble. So, while we want to maximize the share of solar and wind in the grid, it's absolutely critical that we have super, super good communications networks that will be able to manage the whole thing. The more solar and wind we want to introduce into the system, the more we need high-speed, real-time, low-latency communications networks. What we need to do is to, of course, manage the fact that solar and wind are weather-dependent and hard to predict. And when you combine that with the challenge that I just described, that consumption and generation need to be in balance every second, it means that there needs to be available generation that can balance solar and wind when there is no sun and no wind, or alternatively, which is also getting increasingly interesting, is adjusting demand. Either increase generation when needed or adjust demand down. Or then use different types of intermediate storage systems in between. Also a communications network challenge. So what's actually happening right now in the energy system, in the electricity system in particular, is that, that the whole system is developing from one directional pipe, which went from massive power plants all the way to a passive consumer. This is becoming a, a this one directional pipe is transforming into a highly complex distributed network, where potentially every device in the Every device that is using electricity can become an active node in the system, an active intelligent node in the system. This means that the electricity network and the telco network will be tightly interconnected. The same devices will be connected to both networks, and this provides a massive opportunity for all of us in this room. So what we need is fully digitalized and AI-managed energy systems that can identify who needs energy, when they need it, and then deliver it at the lowest possible cost at the right time. This means that businesses can spend less, they can map their energy consumption in advance, and of course, ultimate goal for households need to be lower bills and ultra-reliable supply, all coming from CO2-free sources. So, Connectivity is absolutely critical for a more sustainable world. So today I want to give you a glimpse of what that looks like in practice. And I have three quick stories, three quick videos for you from different partners that highlight the power of connectivity in our pursuit of net zero. So let's start on the outskirts of Vienna. Technology is the key in beating the climate crisis. Without technology, it's not possible to deal with increasing energy consumptions. We need smart solutions. I really think microgrid can make a difference. A microgrid is an intelligent energy system that brings together all the information from the different parts of the local campus, for example, and then optimizes on basis of different parameters. The energy is produced on site via photovoltaic, which we have on our roofs. The consumption is done in a smart way using the microgrid controller to put the energy where it's needed. The dashboard is showing you the life of the microgrid. You see the production of the energy, the consumption of the energy. And after that, of course, you can analyze all this data and make your building much better. It's a great feeling that we know our energy, which we use on a daily basis, is clean and is sustainable. So this entire Siemens Vienna campus is covered by that microgrid, which is enabled by our totally secure 5G private network and to implemented together with A1. These assets communicate with each other in real time. There are about 1,000 data points from 34 different devices. This automatically controls uh, that, uh, how much solar energy gets into the grid and directs it to the most optimal use. This one site saves about 100 tons of CO2 uh, per year, and it is going to actually double from that. But the real point is that, because that's not a very big number, the real point is that we estimate that there are about 14 million industrial campuses around the world. 14 million. So you start to get an idea 
that what, where the technology will ultimately scale. Connectivity in large scale is needed. So let's look at generation side then, and let's turn to North Sea. Our network here in Belgium is one of the largest offshore networks. It's often a very challenging environment, so it's very important for the people offshore that we can ensure that mission critical connectivity. 5G for the wind farm. Importantly for us, it's a stable communication. We cannot physically see 100 turbines from one space. By having that communication, the turbine will tell us when something's not right, and we can then react straight away. Without that, we're pretty much dead in the water. We have turbines of more than eight megawatt per piece. In total, approximately half of the Belgian households can get electricity from our Belgian North Sea. Technology is the only way to fight climate change. We have come a long way, but now we are getting into a next phase. So we should scale up the technology and really, really use it as the way to go to a carbon-free society. So these latest generations of uh, wind turb turbines are about twice as tall as those installed five years ago. That means that the installation is more complicated, maintenance is more complicated. City Mesh is addressing this challenge with connectivity, with investing in connectivity. There is a private network that of course unlocks predictive maintenance. Predictive maintenance has been discussed as part of industrial IoT for quite a long time. There's nothing new in that, but what is now possible is to add new applications like drones and artificial uh, AR, uh, augmented reality-based uh, engineering solutions, all in order to increase the productivity and lower the cost of uh, this type of generation. 572 turbines, over 530 square kilometers of North Sea, energy for about 1 million homes. And then the final third example, uh, what about distribution? Let's turn to the US. 80 years ago, for the most part, there was no electricity in rural America. So the farmers helped themselves. They formed not-for-profit cooperatives and started financing and building the lines themselves. That was our return to work. They pulled together and formed a co-op of co-ops. And that's what we do here at Wabash Valley. This house was built in 1869. Whoever was living here at the time, it was a real event for them to be able to get electric power. Sustainability is something that resonates very well with farmers. Keeping a consistent and dependable electrical source is extremely important. We're able to bring our kids with us to work and they're already dreaming up ideas for the future. We're moving to generation technologies that the fuel comes from the sun, the earth, the wind. So we're very excited about the future. And I feel privileged to be able to serve a small portion of rural America. They've been growing our food there for hundreds of years and they're going to continue for hundreds of years. So power generated to over 300,000 homes, schools, hospitals and businesses across the US Midwest. More and more from renewable sources powered by Nokia's backbone network that provides service providers standard security and reliability to leverage real creativity at the edge of the grid so that they can construct different types of micro solar arrays and uh, capture biogas from dairy farms and, farms and even tap methane from 15 separate uh, landfill sites. So this, type of, this is an example of an American leader in that form of energy generation. So those three quick examples, but this is of course not only about or just energy. Telcos are rolling out products and services that unlock sustainability everywhere. There is, of course, industrial campus networks that, like the one that we saw in Vienna that enable more efficient use of energy and, very importantly, more efficient use of materials. There is network slicing for bespoke digitalization. There are new types of algorithms that dial down energy consumption of assets when they are not used. Home broadband is now using 38% less power than in 2007 despite the fact that speeds have increased by a factor of 64. There is edge computing and intelligence, in manage, intelligence managing exponential growth in network capacity requirements. And then, of course, there is 5G. As we all know, it's improved spectral efficiency, meaning less energy per bit. Our technology vision goes big on the idea of digital twins. 
we already know about their potential for industry, but of, what, what if we think about, if we think a little bigger, the connection capacity of 5G and then 5G advanced and uh, ultimately 6G will allow us to create a constantly improving feedback loop between the virtual and physical worlds. We'll be able to produce digital twins of cities, nations, even of planet Earth. We could track the growth and recession of forests and polar ice in real time and know the implications in terms of carbon release. We could map the evolution of our energy, transportation and utility infrastructures over huge geographical areas and model the impacts of overlapping policy developments, knowing exactly what will change and when. So this deep compute real world metaverse is not the cherry on top of sustainability. It is sustainability itself. And it's all, it's all based on connectivity. To support the work of this sector, I have three asks. First, the telecoms industry is, of course, constantly developing new tools to squeeze every last drop of capacity out of customers' existing spectrum. But to keep pace with demand, governments need to get their act together and release affordable, affordable, this is really important, affordable new spectrum across low, mid, high and ultra high band ranges, allocated specifically for mobile broadband, allowing industry to connect more and emit, and emit less. Number two, mobilize markets. The only realistic path to net zero involves mobilizing market forces. There is no way how governments or taxpayers could fund all the massive investments that will be needed for the green transformation. The only way to get there is to mobilize market forces. And by far, the best example that I have seen so far is the European Union's emission trading system, which is a very simple and effective system that has already uh, slashed about 1 billion tons of emissions uh, in Europe in about uh, 10 uh, years or so, and, and it continues. Very simple principle. You emit or, or launch to the market a certain number of emission uh, certificates every year. That number is reduced year after year. And everybody who wants to emit CO2 needs to buy a certificate. That's the only thing you need to do. You don't need to do anything else. When you control the supply of emission certificates, you automatically drive down emissions and the markets decide what are the best and most efficient ways of reducing emissions. This is a great example of a system that is delivering and this is something that should be replicated also elsewhere. And then number three, do the right thing. While we in our, while our industry puts pressure on governments to act, of course, we too have a massive responsibility to do the right thing. We need to, first of all, play by the rules, behave ethically and build trust. In other words, we want, need to make tech and tech companies a force for good. Environmental sustainability, yes, of course, it's a big part of that. And there's a plenty of things we can do. I'm proud that Nokia is committed to 100% renewable energy in our own operations by 2025 and also build and use products that do more with less energy. Energy efficiency is at the heart of, of our design. We have a, here made several important launches, AVA energy efficiency service, AI reducing network energy usage by up to 30%. We have a new generation of uh, chipsets for broadband, uh, fixed broadband uh, that cut about half of the power of previous generations. New generation of routing silicon cutting 75% of power consumption of previous generations. Data center portfolio launch 66% through innovations in routing platform design. Our new generation of uh, mobile base stations, air scale portfolio, 75% cut in energy consumption. And today I'm proud to launch the next phase of the base station evolution. And that is our new liquid-cooled base station. Our air scale now includes a new baseband solution, which is not air-cooled, it's liquid-cooled. Why is this important? Liquid as a transport medium for heat is about 4,000 times more efficient than air. 
So this new baseband solution, you see some kind of a picture there. The blue line is cold water and, and the red line is hot water that goes back, back from the system, uh, reduces energy consumption of cooling, the cooling system by 90% and base station CO2 emissions by 80%. By 80% base station CO2 emissions. So telcos can help others to cut emissions while also cutting their own. So, ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is this. Digitalization can, can enable cuts in emissions up to 10 times larger than those of the telecommunications industries itself, telecommunications industries own emissions, 10 times more in other industries. And I'm proud that our industry has that responsibility. And make no mistake, it's a big responsibility. So let's live up to the trust that has been placed on us. And let's be constantly innovating, doing the right thing. And, uh, and yes, let's also try to move a little bit faster. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no green without digital. Thank you.